So welcome to everybody who's online uh, to the webinar on where Dan Mecklenburg is going to be talking about the report that he and Laura Fay have put out <coughs> um, detailing their investigation of stream mitigation and restoration projects. This is, uh, I guess you could call it an encore presentation. Uh, we did, uh, Dan did present a webinar uh, a couple of months ago maybe, and we got a request from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to, to do a repeat of the webinar, and we were happy to do that. And we also have obviously opened that up to, to anyone who was interested in participating. So we're glad to present Dan again and, and his presentation. There is a recording of that first webinar up on the Ohio Watershed Network website. We will also be recording, and probably are at this moment, recording this presentation. And uh, we won't necessarily have that link up on our website, but if you want to get a link to this presentation, let me know. And we'll be happy to, to send that on to anybody that's interested in, in seeing it again. I want to get folks uh, familiar with the WebEx Event Center because that is going to be your link to asking questions or sending in comments. So uh, in the window that you should be looking at right now, to the left, the big window, you should be seeing uh, Dan's first slide, an investigation of stream mitigation and restoration. On the upper right, you should see a panel that, that uh, says who the speakers are. I believe you would be seeing that. And then down below that, you should see a chat window. And below that uh, is a chat box where you can enter your questions and comments. So at the very lower right-hand corner, there is a window there. It should say, uh, select a participant in the send to menu first, type chat message and send. So right above that window where you'll be typing in your questions, it says send to, and then you can click on that box and it gives you several options. Uh, I think you have the host and presenter option. Um, so when you type, before you type in your question, please select host and presenter. Uh, if you send it to host, that's okay. If you just use the default, that's fine because Brian will get it and he'll forward to me. But you select the person you want to send your message to and then down below in the text window, type in your question and send it off. Now, um, this is going to be different from the first time we did this webinar, but you probably won't be seeing that text box during the presentation because of the way that Dan is going to be connecting to the WebEx. So probably you will only see Dan's slides for the duration of the presentation. So you probably won't be able to submit questions during the presentation. So you might want to have a notepad or something nearby to jot down any questions you have during that presentation. And then at the end, when Dan's PowerPoint is closed out, we'll come back to this window you're looking at now, and you'll be able to type in your questions. So we're going to save the questions until the end. Um, so you might, like I said, you might want to just jot down some notes as, as the presentation is going so you don't forget your questions. A couple other things is we will be sending out a, uh, a link for an evaluation. These evaluations are very helpful for our presenter and also for, for us to uh, give us a, a better sense of how the technology worked and what you did and didn't like about the presentation. So please do complete that evaluation. It's a very quick one. I think it's only a few questions. It'll take you about a, a minute, minute and a half, probably at the most. Um, what was anything else that I wanted to cover? I think that's probably it for now. Um, I see Brian sent me a question. I want to ask if I could give a brief summary of the Ohio Watershed Academy. Yeah, I can, uh, I can do that at the end. If I, if I don't think of it, just send me another reminder message to, to go over the Ohio Watershed Academy and, and what that's about. But 
We're going to leave plenty of time for questions after the presentation. You can hang on for all of those, or you know, at any time when folks are ready to leave, that's fine. I think we're ready to go now then. And so, Dan, I'm going to turn it over to you and then let you get to the presentation. All right, Joe, Joe thanks a lot. Um, I really appreciate all you setting all of this up and Brian making it possible for me to be sitting at my desk and everybody else out there not doing a lot of driving today is wonderful. Um, and I appreciate people uh, signing in that, uh, that uh, listened to a little bit about this investigation and dominated two years of my life. So it's uh, not a small effort. And uh, while I like going out and uh, looking at streams and figuring out what's going on, I don't like driving to meetings. So this is a nice, wonderful way for sharing this information, making that possible. Thanks, Joe. Anyway, uh, an investigation of streams mitigation and restoration. Uh, did that at, here at the Department of Natural Resources uh, along with Laura Fay. Um, Laura Fay had been in the um, Ohio EPA 401 program, so uh, working on mitigation and restoration of streams there before she came up and uh, started working with me principally on this project. Um, and we had a number of other, uh, particularly soil scientists from the division, thank them and can't forget the funding coming from the uh, Ohio Water Development Authority. And I'm going to try to switch the screen to having the PowerPoint run on my computer so the transitions work a little bit better. Hopefully everything's working for everybody. Uh, okay. Uh, so I, uh, we've I, along with a number of people, have gone to a significant effort assessing how stream restorations um, how well it's uh, progressing, uh, how, how well we're succeeding at our effort to try to build good streams. I'm not alone by any stretch of the imagination in people doing that kind of around now or in the last few years. I've seen a number of reports coming from around the country and even around the world, in Australia, New Zealand, Denmark was the last one that I saw. Um, just another one from North Carolina, I guess. I just saw it two days ago. Um, so it seems like the time must be right uh, for people to, um, now that we've been building streams for a while, uh, to be asking how we're doing and, and going out and actually gathering a bit of evidence to see just what is taking place out there. This is what... Uh, 54 looks like. Uh, these are um, 54 blocks on your screen. Uh, that's 54 streams that uh, we went out and assessed. This is the distribution of those around the state of Ohio. Uh, the projects, the stream restoration work, um, we looked through all of the 401 mitigation projects nationwide. 27, 38, super fun cleanup. There was one of those. Um, but pretty much the projects that we were uh, scoping out to try to find uh, work to stream restoration to analyze came from those data sets. Um, Dan, this is Joe. Sorry to interrupt. Can you quickly yeah. just uh, say what 27 and 38 refers to? Uh, not sure I exactly can. Uh, 27 is. Uh, um, stream restoration uh, nationwide so that there's less of a review required and uh, 38 um, I don't know what that is but I do know that those are phase intimately sections related. in the is it Clean Water Act under section 404 that describes specific kinds of projects that yeah uh, these, these are all regula uh, regulatory mechanisms that uh, I imagine most people in the audience know much better than I do. Um, but the, having a nationwide permit means a streamlined review process for doing a modification of a stream. Okay. Thanks. 
Um, if, looking at that, what that means to me is the purpose of these projects are on 47 of the projects, people really didn't want to be doing the work, uh, being required to do something, whereas seven of the projects would have been projects that maybe somebody sought out funds and grants to actually make an improvement because they wanted to make an improvement. Something interesting to keep in the back of your mind. Um, the criteria we used, I mean, there's an awful lot of uh, permitted projects, but the ones that we selected to look at were the ones where we could define significant stream work. So that's not bank stabilization projects that wouldn't certainly be uh, um, tree plantings or different kinds of habitat modification or introducing species plantings uh, or fish or anything like that being introduced. Um, and it wouldn't be preservation kinds of work. So there's an awful lot of projects that aren't included here um, by that uh, criteria of significant stream work or actually doing physical earthwork to the channel. And projects that were greater than three years old. Uh, streams are dynamic systems that uh, anything can be built, but what's it going to look like as time goes on? And by looking at the age of the projects, you can really see that, uh, well, maybe now is a logical time to be asking this question on how we're doing, because we really couldn't ask it earlier than that. The, still, the projects that we have to look at are four or five years old, six years old. Uh, while the window goes back farther than that, I think that 11 and 12 years old, that just represents just one project out there on each of those years. So they're older projects. Uh, we haven't been in the business of trying to manipulate streams and with, with the expectation that they're actually going to be ecologically better, whatever that means. Uh, that's not any small uh, statement there either on whatever that means. That's, we can go out and assess projects um, by, by some method. Um, but that method is not, by any stretch of the imagination, established. There's, there's not one recognized technique for going out and proving that a project has succeeded or failed. So that means going back to the basics. In Ohio, we've got this very sound idea of ecological integrity. Um, and uh, I think th this nice diagram that, uh, shows how uh, this newer concept of ecological services kind of might be tied to that ecological integrity that we have been using. Um, if the services are things like nitrogen removal, flood control, the different kinds of biotic communities that we may want, it's uh, these, see that these nested down to the individual services so that if we look at uh, this sequence, this, this nested um, sequence leading up to an ultimate ecological service, um, we can certainly measure something like flood control. We, we could do different kinds of hydraulic modeling on flood control, or we could go out and do sampling for nitrogen removal, um, or go out and find different species that live in the stream. Uh, but measuring all of that long list, that continuing list up there of all the different kinds of things that streams do for us, I think what we're, I think a better approach is to scrutinize that nested sequence and find out what a necessary link is that's actually measurable and that is manipulated by the process of doing restoration. So in this nested sequence of functions, what is manipulated by restoration, and just as importantly, what's measurable. And those are the kinds of things that we were wondering about and trying to define. Um, certainly, that's not going to be done by one discipline, so we use the multidisciplinary evaluation, um, biology and vegetation indices, and certainly channel morphology and riparian soils in there was a big part of it. Um, and you can see what we're up against on some of these sites. It's kind of hard to find anything to measure to determine just what on earth good is taking place out there on some of them, unfortunately, even 
with a multidisciplinary evaluation. Um, so, going jumping right to some of the findings that we have, uh, the easiest thing to do is to describe the sites that are being restored, uh, and those, as you can judge by the regulatory list that we had, and they're being done by land development predominantly. Um, that means that fairly short reaches are being manipulated at time, 1,000 feet is kind of the median, uh, with the, the majority of them the vast majority of them falling into that range that's bracketed there, 500 to 1,000. Um, and they're in small watersheds. Uh, 200 acres would be typical, but really not many outside of the range of 100 to 400 acres. Um, and fairly low gradient as well. That uh, number three and number four together, that winds up being an extremely important number because the multiple of those two things is extremely telling. Uh, we can get something called stream power uh, as the product of the amount of water we have, which the size of the watershed will tell us, and the slope. So multiplying the amount of water times the slope tells us that we have, well, if both of those numbers are small, we're going to have extremely small energies or extremely small stream power as are the typical sites that we're looking at. If we do, we get projects, um, what, what, a, what a low energy, small, low gradient stream looks like is in that picture there. Um, and, and the unfortunate thing about that is that there was a significant effort that was made to uh, do that restoration. And uh, it had a completely unintended outcome that it was intended to be a meandering channel with riffles and pools. Um, and it turned into, quite promptly, a meandering path of cattails with high ground around that channel that is not very well connected with that flow at all. A little finer point on that, if we look at the values of uh, stream power um, relative to uh, what's typical out there, look over to the right of this graph, the Ohio named streams. That would be 50% uh, of the streams in the box and the whiskers representing the streams. Um, so if, if that's the range of streams that are we typically think of as streams, um, they, that stream power of 67 is vastly larger than the bars that we have to the left, which are the 50, 54 restored streams that have, have been restored in the state of Ohio. So the typical streams uh, that are being, the streams that are typical of the ones that we're restoring are anything but typical of a classic stream. Again, no end to the very low energy examples with that uh, typical stream constructed, a meandering channel, single thread, riffles and pools, uh, promptly turning into a meandering wetland. No end to examples. Where uh, in this last one, I'm standing on one bank of the channel and holding the camera up high over my head to try to get a picture of Laura Fay over there on the other side of the channel. So can't emphasize that enough, that the typical the streams typically restored are not the typical streams. We're dealing with a data set that's at one end of the spectrum, or dominated by one end of the spectrum. Uh, moving on to uh, riffles, which are a big part of a lot of the projects. Um, and a very important aspect of those is vertical stability. Riffles are constructed for a number of reasons, probably the most important of which is um, ensuring that the channels don't downcut or incise. Uh, this is one of the very few examples that we came across that there was some vertical instability. In other words, the channels were downcutting to some extent. But that didn't seem to be the case on many sites at all, really only two that it was real problematic. And, and even there, it wasn't drastically problematic. But uh, on this site, there was a lot of material that was constructed, was placed there initially, 
and that it's all long gone, leaving only the very large stuff that, uh, and even additional large stuff, I suspect, has been dumped in there as I see concrete and things as the channel wants to continue to downcut. More commonly with the riffles, we see uh, uh, the stable channels not downcutting, but to ensure that that takes place, there's a payoff that you put natural streams will have uh, coarse material that uh, every now and then is mobilized. And when, when it is, the, it releases the fines that might accumulate uh, during smaller flows. If the material is large enough that it never rolls around or jumps from one riffle, bounces down to the next, we wind up with rocks like you see there in my hand that are completely sealed off. But all the interstitial spaces are sealed off underneath that. When looking down on it, it looks like a nice cobbly riffle. It is, it's uh, just that's pavement that there is no interstitial flow in that, no oxygen getting down underneath those rocks. And uh, lost habitat, lost very important habitat. Uh, so that is a common condition. We saw that on the majority of constructed riffles on, of those 54, the ones that did have uh, constructed riffles, it, it was coarse material, luckily stable, but there's a payoff that uh, it's not being mobilized and not releasing those fines and anoxic um, embedded substrates. A another real common manifestation of that is I'm, take, I'm standing in a pool of this intermittent channel. It's dry at the moment, but this is where a pool is. And right in the center of the photo is the riffle, the beginning of the riffle, which goes off into those cattails. So the riffle was constructed there. That coarse material trapped the fine. A stable substrate was an ideal place for vegetation to colonize. So seeing the vegetation, seeing the riffles turn into little units of uh, emergent vegetation was a real common condition out there. Um, We'll see what happens. I mean, these are five, six years old. What's going to happen once we might get a little bit of canopy over this? I imagine that would change, but that's going to be 10, 15, 20 years out that we might uh, see this transition into something that would be uh, more recognizable as a riffle rather than a little unit of wetland. So the frequently embedded substrate, you can see the picture of me as I'm doing my pebble count. I pick up a pebble and it releases all that uh, fine material around it and turbid water down there. Um, another result of that is if we build a riffle and it's got slope to it and a very flat stream, uh, the only reason we can get any fall down the riffle is by making the upstream end higher. We're creating backwater conditions. So there are, um, again, not an uncommon scenario if we put riffles really where they're not in wouldn't normally be found. It's kind of a misfit of uh, trying to get that structure in the very low sloped streams. Um, we're creating backwater conditions. Which we could probably talk about uh, a bit more. Backwater conditions are probably a uh, very common type of characteristic in pre-settlement headwater streams in North America. 400 years ago, there were, um, according to the literature, uh, between 5 to 10 beaver per mile in headwater streams. Uh, that, that means that with their active ponds, as well as the older ponds that have been abandoned, there existed uh, dam every, uh, or at the density of 5 to 20 beaver dams, beaver ponds per mile. They wouldn't all be ponds. They, they would be uh, ponds that had filled in with sediment and be more of a beaver meadow. In fact, uh, some compelling literature suggests that that might, in fact, be one of the most representative channel types that we had in our first and second order streams across North America um, is a beaver meadow kind of a condition. So these creating this or anything that resembles this on uh, with riffles is, is certainly unintended, 
but I, I don't know if it's a bad thing. Uh, it probably could be a more efficient design process uh, if, if this was these were the kinds of characteristics that we were looking for, rather than arriving here by accident or arriving with at something like this by accident. Three of the streams, three of the 54 streams that we surveyed, uh, had beaver dams on them. So uh, probably worth thinking about and deciding what, what a, what's a appropriate stream characteristics and what we want to do with this, whether we want to build streams that have these characteristics or we want to let beaver uh, go ahead and, and do this kind of work. I, I have heard that uh, stream restoration projects elsewhere, um, they have had beaver control programs to keep the beaver out of them because they had spent so much money of the public dollars on creating a particular stream with particular characteristics, they decided that it was their responsibility to protect that public investment and keep it a single thread meandering channel with the riffles and pools. So I, I, I'm not sure that I quite agree with that thinking. I, I do think that this is a huge issue that affects, I mean, if we give any weight to that idea of looking at reference reaches and using that as a blueprint, a guiding image on what should be we should be doing with our landscape, um, whether we let the beaver in or whether we try designing these kinds of uh, processes, and these kinds of systems, um, I, I think that uh, a major point. One of the other people we should thank today is Mike Smith at the Army Corps of Engineers for uh, not only um, helping or organize the webinar, but uh, also building or also having this site built. Um, this wasn't on the list, but uh, this is a site that uh, Mike Smith, the Army Corps of Engineers, now, back when he was at Ohio EPA, he uh, got the, um, this site built that I, I think is a much better fit to the landscape than anything else that could be built here. There could always be more of it, but I, I think that picture that we're seeing on the right is, I'd, I'd call it a wet meadow, a lot of shrubs and no defined channel in there, unless we call the whole thing a defined channel. Um, but this small, low gradient area was, the, the whole site was probably a, a broad, wet meadow pre-settlement or pre-agriculture when the when a channel was constructed, a ditch right through the middle of it to make the land more usable. So what should be restored here? The, the, should we keep it a defined ditch, or should we look back to that wet meadow kind of condition that ex existed, maybe not unlike what we would have had in an old beaver dam kind of filled in area that would have flattened out the gradients. Um, so I think this is a uh, an ideal fit to this low energy landscape, at least on this site, with just a small little 166 acre watershed, intermittent flow coming to this uh, area that I think uh, is a, an alternative view that may that works better in, in uh, here anyway. Uh, intermission for a, an unnecessary intermission for a commercial. I'm sure everybody's un well versed in all the benefits of floodplains and how much we need them, and that uh, if we're looking at ecological services uh, that streams do, we're looking at the ecological services that streams and floodplains as a continuum do. I think we've kind of done ourselves a disservice when we start thinking about streams as channels and floodplains being something different. A more accurate view is thinking of streams that become are, are narrower most of the time and widen out some of the times. So that narrowing and widening, when streams are wider, that's when they're doing much of the work, much of the ecological services that streams do provide with the mixing on, between the channel and the floodplain, the deposition on the floodplain, the valley storage and peak flow attenuation, nutrient and uh, uh, pollutant uptake. So back to our regularly scheduled program. Uh-oh. There we go. 
floodplains. Well, we can say floodplains are good and flooding is necessary for these services, but how do we measure that? Um, uh, I did not find a nice technique for measuring floodplain connectivity. Uh, we've got things like entrenchment ratios, um, but uh, they did not. It's a, um, two widths, one based on a high flood, corresponding with something like a 50-year flood, and then the width of a bankful channel. It was just too crude of a measurement to really uh, correlate well with the actual flooding that uh, takes place on a site, which we estimated rather laboriously by calculating the peak discharge of the entire array of storms from 100 year down to the 0.2 year recurrence interval. If we, by taking all of those storms um, within our surveyed cross section, seeing how, what stage they achieved at our surveyed cross sections, we could get an area that was inundated by each of those events. Multiplying those areas by the number of occurrences of each of those events, so a 100 year storm would get one, uh, multiplied by one, while well, a 0.2 year recurrence interval storm would be multiplied by a big number. Um, we can get the floodplain connectivity. Oh, I misspoke. We only went down to a 0.8 year recurrence interval storm, since that's what corresponds with the um, bank full flows most often. Um, so but in that range, we can get a total area that's inundated over a long period of time. Um, and figured that that was probably not a value, bad value at all to really be estimating fairly precisely the um, connectivity, floodplain connectivity. Well, if we look at uh, what a natural stream might produce uh, as far as the amount of um, exposure the waters have to a floodplain, that would be on the graph there 100 percent. So if we, whatever size the stream is, we can see what typical floodplain widths that would have and over that long period of time what would be that inundated area. Um, so that 100% that is a, a natural kind of median, ranging around that, of course, but that's a nice median. And the bars, again, are the 54 streams that were surveyed. It's great to see off to the right of that the wide and low connected floodplain that is several times more, in some cases, the, what would occur on, on most natural streams. Um, and the middle section there in the tan, that would be, uh, well, it's below the median, but natural streams are below the median as well. Um, really, most streams would be down, most, not many natural streams are down below 50% of that, that target value. And that tan line goes all the way down to 30% of the target value. Um, in there, we'd expect that the streams would still be providing some services, but diminished below that threshold where it turns to red off to the left. We'd expect um, the characteristics associated with that level of entrenchment would be instability, um, poor quality habitat, and uh, no ecological services to speak of. Um, and you can see the pictures of the two examples. The entrenched stream up on the left is what we did see on an unfortunately large number of the projects. Not all of them, of course, but uh, a problematic third looked like this one. Uh, this stream uh, picture out in the top right there in a meandering channel was constructed with ripples and pools. Maybe that's what it was asked for. That's certainly what the consultant had in mind of a natural channel design would be. Is, and uh, completely neglected any idea of uh, floodplain connectivity that you can see in the graph, uh, surveyed cross section, where the blue line in the center there would be bank full flows. Um, so we get up above bank full, and we'd expect our frequent frequent floods to be getting out across a floodplain. Uh, the green lines would show us what kind of a target width on the natural channel, just a typical natural channel, would have that kind of a width of a floodplain. Um, but they obviously didn't get that, even the fairly large events. I forget what recurrence interval we have for that. The red arrow is there, but they're getting to be rare storms 
are still contained within this defined channel. Another example of the same thing we have uh, on a in highway freeway interchange um, uh, meandering channel with uh, through the middle of the site riffles and pools constructed and a fairly narrow low floodplain around it. You can see in the photograph there the, where it's low and and wet. That's that's where the water is interacting with the surrounding floodplain. Um, that that's the width of the frequent floods in the graph there kind of corresponds with the green that we see up there. That's our lush floodplain. Where surrounding it we've got all of this land, an incredible amount of space that isn't all that high, but it's high enough to be out of reach for the floodwaters, for the stream. The stream is not utilizing this floodplain, if we can even call it a floodplain. Out to the arrows that came down there, that's a by just excavating two feet out to the extreme there, and that triangle, that would make it half that width, one foot of excavation on average across that area. Look what we would have been able to achieve as far as uh, repairing an area, a uh, floodplain that's providing services, if we would have, for a, for a foot of excavation. Well, they could have easily done that. There's plenty of room on site. They could have even spoiled that. We were so close to getting that very important aspect of this stream, but we didn't. So close yet so far, and I suspect it, no one, none of us asked them to do it. None of us asked for that uh, low, wet, active floodplain. Well, putting it in those terms, you know, it's a low floodplain. That's that's one thing. But if if they're ever going to make it into a um, practical regulatory kind of a realm, we need to be able to quantify it. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of ways of quantifying floodplain. This is the one that we came up with that be, and, and like because it uh, correlated so well with all of those stages, the actual floodplain connectivity that we were estimating based on all those different recurrence intervals and stages. So we looked at uh, three different stages, representative stages of the bankful channel max depth and then two times that max depth like the entrenchment ratio uses, and also the 1.5 times the max depth. And uh, saw what those numbers would be on a, on a uh, corresponding with the, kind of the, the actual inundation, that this would predict that actual inundation or exposure to floodwaters really well. That uh, is written up now in the proposed EPA draft mitigation rules. Anybody's guess on where those are going to go, but uh, uh, maybe we'll see more of this. Anyway, whether it's this or whether it's something else, quantifying and asking for um, floodplain seems like it's a worthwhile step. Moving on to another aspect of streams in our multidisciplinary approach is the not just the um, floodplain as far as the height and extent of it goes, but what's the quality of it? What is it, what is it composed of? Um, with the soil scientists here at the Division of Soil and Water Resources um, used a method that's similar to the uh, septic suitability protocol that they follow for analyzing soils, um, but to describe those soils with their on-site investigation on all of these projects, as well as in, uh, quite a few reference sites. Um, in addition, they're looking at a, a soil infiltration um, test that they're running in that lower left corner there. Uh, the findings, the, the soil ranged, um, of course, from exceptionally poor to very good. Um, that, that range in itself kind of suggests that maybe it, it hasn't been on the radar. People haven't been thinking about it when designing streams, or, um, to how to obtain quality riparian soils, that necessary role that they play in the, so many of the ecological services. 
um, the rod going across the floodplain here. That is a floodplain off to the right, uh, the bankful channel below the rod. And you can see the floodplain there and just imagine the soil quality. Look real close, you can see the forested riparian that's been planted into that stuff. And Laura Faye standing there just coming down the side slope, getting ready to step onto the floodplain. Uh, analyzing the soils, um, trying to make uh, some uh, practical sense of them uh, wasn't any easy feat, and I'm not sure that we succeeded. But one thing that we can say is uh, we can look at each of the characteristics that are described by the soil scientists, from the horizon thicknesses, percent organic matter, root density, uh, consistency, or how friable the material is, uh, permeability and uh, compare those things to the averages of all of the sites. So we took all of those characteristics into, uh, together to get a composite soil quality, and then looked at each one of those characteristics to see how they compared to that composite. Um, what we found is that uh, there wasn't that many flyers. In other words, we wouldn't have sites that had a lot of organic matter but didn't have much root density. If we got one, it seemed like we had um, most of there is good correlation between each of these independently and all of them together is what these graphs are showing us. And what that tells us is that we can look at one as an indicator of overall soil health. Not a perfect indicator, as no indicator is, but something like maybe organic matter would be testable and measurable at a, at a point that uh, would be able to check the quality of the soils. Or, or any of these others, I don't know. Oh, I guess I should have explained this a bit more, that we've got three bars on each of these graphs. The, uh, the left bar is the, the reference site. So you can see uh, the, the best soils were very good. They were on par uh, with the naturally forming riparian soils. And the worst sites were uh, consistently very bad. Um, another way to put it would be uh, uh, one of our soil scientists did when we were first going out and exploring what kind of methods we might use. We went out to first one soy site, uh, one on the right, and then off the, the one on the left, and he said it's the difference between night and day, that they're really that drastic a difference in the, the range exhibited on the different sites. Again, in an a effort, maybe a desperate effort, to try to make heads or tails of any of this and make it usable would be uh, shown in this graph, where what we did is things that uh, would be known prior to construction, such as uh, whether the existing material would be used for the floodplain, or whether different uh, material would be brought in, or whether it would be um, deposited material or whether it would be uh, existing or natural floodplain, for example, raising a stream up and reconnecting it to a floodplain. Those are different design strategies. Those are different design specifications that are known up front and uh, are valuable because indeed they are. So what the graph does is, I'm sure you can see lots of red on the right and lots of blue on the left. To the extent the right is red and the blue is left, that's the extent that we can predict the soil characteristics that are all of those organic matter permeability, those things, um, with uh, these construction parameters of recent deposition or of the existing material on different horizons. And that, that could be used. I mean, look at. Uh, giving credit for a recent deposition or uh, a existing on-site A horizon kinds of material and taking credit away or discouraging uh, constructed material, poor resoiling material, or um, uh, certainly material that was uh, um, in place lower horizons. By, by crediting and debiting a site with those measurable or knowable criteria up front, we could be predicting 
what uh, the quality of the soil was going to be. I can set that. Yeah, avoid poor resoiling material and avoid constructing floodplains by excavating the subsoil is the killer. So what have we got for concluding thoughts? Um, first, restoration is still fairly new. We know a lot more than we knew, but we certainly don't know mu as much as we will. Um, we haven't been in the business very long. Uh, I, I think the restoration that has taken place, I'm pointing out a lot of things that are wrong with it, but I, I, I've been involved in having those built, and I'm sure many of you have as well, and I think we should be patting ourselves on the back because there, <laughs> we certainly have done a lot better in the last 10, 15 years than we were before that time. So I, I think uh, maybe not as efficiently and certainly not optimally, but we have we have come a fair way. Um, it's just that I think that there's a seems like there's an awful lot of potential that if we can get a little bit more sophisticated in what it is we're asking for and what it is we try to achieve, we're going to be uh, better able to do that. Judging on the sites that have been restored, the driving force of restoration work has been mitigation. Uh, that's uh, got a certain amount of uh, pros and cons to it, or maybe baggage with it, and it's probably worth pointing out that as far as restoration goes, the right amount of the, the restoration that we may want to be doing in the future, the types of restoration projects we may want to do in the future, money may be more of an issue. There's, there's not any other time in history than for a piece of property where uh, where as much money is, is spent on it and that land use as that land use transition from when it's um, less intensive agricultural forested kinds of uses to urban uses so that land use tr transition uh, a lot of money's dumped on a piece of property uh, that makes some things possible and makes some things not an issue it certainly influences the kinds of work that's taking place there. Uh, there has been a lack of guidance. There is a lack of guidance. Um, I, going back to the beginning of the talk, uh, there's not a set of standards that says you meet this criteria and your project's a success. You don't meet it, and it's, it's not. There is not only the lack of indicators of success, but what, what are the design specifications that people should be following to achieve that? that different things out there, but there is not a clear, helpful, thorough guidance that are leading people to efficiently produce quality projects. And, uh, um, with, a, with the lack of guidance that has existed, um, consultants, consultants have been left uh, to define uh, projects, what's needed on projects. Um, and consultants get paid for bills and whistles. Um, it does not appear that there, we observed lots of bills and whistles on 54 projects that were not, uh, probably not the best bang for the buck. That uh, the, yeah, well, yep. Yeah. onto room to improvement. That, uh, the, the big one here is that we, we've all got, it's like you say tiger, and try, try not to picture a tiger in your mind. Um, you say stream, and what picture comes to mind? You do a Google search and look up stream, you're going to find, you're going to find waterfalls is what you're going to find, and, and you're going to find rapids, and those certainly riffles and pools are in our some of our best, most loved streams. If that's the image that we have in mind, uh, that, that's fine, but it can't be limited to that because that's certainly just one type of channel. That's th those, those characteristics just fit one set of driving variables. Um, and 
the streams that are being constructed, uh, the, the ones that are being restored now, the ones that are probably in most need of restoration in the future are not the typical streams. The typical streams of, that are being restored and need to be restored are not the typical streams. Um, and they're not one thing either, that there's a broad spectrum of um, more of a wetland stream, certainly, I'm seeing a lot of that that fit, that the streams fit into that kind of a, a predicted type of characteristic as they be a wetland stream. Um, to more of a single thread channel that uh, doesn't have riffles and pools, you know, a deep, narrow, single thread channel, to braided channels, to step pool channels and continuous rapids, and the whole spectrum needs to somehow be addressed and encouraged where appropriate, rather than encouraging or even allowing things that are such a poor fit. So what is it that we should be asking for? What is it that we should be designing? What are the critical aspects of a, of a construction project that need to be built so that the system has a high ecological integrity, uh, is a functioning system that pr provides uh, all of those, uh, lives up to the, its potential ecological services that it can be providing? What are those basic building blocks? Not nearly as exciting as uh, building um, uh, all the bells and whistles, but things like organic, percent organic matter in soil or floodplain connectivity, by whatever definition we give it, may be far more important aspects, building blocks, to eventually uh, achieving a successful design that has that high degree of ecological integrity. So that's about it. Uh, the report is available uh, from the Division of Soil and Water Resources website. You can download the report. Uh, also, there's photos of all of the sites. It, uh, it looks something like this. An example of one of them. It's uh, kind of fun to go through and see what what these sites look like, as well as some of the critic or key numbers that are, are produced: stream power, floodplain connectivity, soil health, and HHEI habitat indicator. Are uh, shown along with an uh, uh, image like that of each of the sites. A pretty quick way to go through and get a feel for what it is that uh, we measured. So thank you very much. Um, and I don't know how we switch this back over to uh, having uh, questions and answers. But uh, that's uh, my contact information. And certainly talking about it's easy. I look forward to hearing from some of you, or at least download the report or look at the pictures. Joe, are we Thanks, Dan. back up to where uh, we can ask questions? People should be viewing the window that we started with now with the text box down in the lower right-hand corner. So if you have questions or comments that you would like to communicate to Dan, then um, type it into that text box. You'll notice the send to right above there. If you can, uh, click on I think it's host and, and uh, presenter before you type in your question and then hit return. But that's how we're going to field questions from folks out there in the audience. And, and while, while folks are figuring that out, Dan, I uh, have a question. It's kind of a question comment for you. I was at a meeting recently with uh, George L. Maragi, Chief of the Division of Surface Water with Ohio EPA, and he mentioned an effort that's underway at Ohio EPA, as I understand it, to create a something similar to a mitigation bank for streams uh, like they currently have with wetlands that, uh, that a permitted operation that is required to do mitigation 
could pay, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, a fee, rather than doing a restoration themselves, paying for it, but and then that fee would potentially be uh, administered through the Nature Conservancy, who would then go about finding an appropriate mitigation site. Are you aware of that effort, and how do you see that uh, working into maybe addressing some of the shortcomings that you're seeing in some of these mitigation sites? Well, there's uh, one aspect of the mitigation banking um, is I think it certainly got a place and has a potential use, worthwhile use. Uh, I, I'm concerned when I think about wetlands being used as the blueprint for it. With a wetland, they're um, generally far more isolated than a stream is. With a with a stream, you've got uh, a point A and a point B. The water had flown to a site, and it will flow away from the site after going between those two points. It's gonna, it will always have flow between those points in some manner. With a wetland, maybe we can take a lot of those services and relocate them. But if I'm downstream from a site, um, and between point A and point B was providing some services in the past, that uh, it's not going to do any good for somewhere else for us, uh, if, if those services are, are taken away. We've still got the water flowing through that reach. We've got to determine kind of how, the, well, the regulatory agencies have to determine kind of how high a bar will be set for a developer. But completely walking away from that flow path between those two points, I think, would be a mistake. Maybe there's, a, if, if not much can be done there, there need, should there don't be held to do additional work somewhere else or contribute to additional work somewhere else. But I'm most interested in, even given constraints, what's the best that we can do uh, between those two points, so that downstream will still benefit from whatever services, even if it's at some diminished level. What would be the best fit, or what would be the best uh, design that could still be in there? I, I hate to see a section of stream go into a storm sewer, uh, just completely go away. Whatever's going to go into that storm sewer is going to come out of the storm sewer. There's, there's always going to be something that uh, can be done there, short of putting it in the pipe, that uh, would be doing something for uh, providing that benefit downstream, that watershed benefit. OK, we got a question from Kip. He asks, uh, are there specific stream mitigation requirements in Ohio, and if so, has this report changed those requirements? Well, specific there are requirements. Um, how specific they are, uh, that that's, uh, depends on how you ask the question. Uh, no, I, I, there, there are definite requirements through the Ohio EPA water quality certification, the 401 program and requirements through the uh, Army Corps of Engineers 404 program. There may be other local requirements on, in different areas when it comes to things like crossing watersheds. or, um, But uh, no, those are the two principal regulatory authorities that, that are definite. But how specific they are, again, that's, that's, uh, we haven't known exactly what to ask for. Uh, nobody has. Uh, so at this point where we're we're all around the world looking at the, these projects, seeing how they're turning out. Um, we're figuring out just, I think a, a lot of people are now in this situation where we're trying to figure out the specifics of those requirements. Right now, there's draft regulations for the Ohio EPA, the mitigation work there. But uh, th those have been in their draft state for a while, and uh, th th those have been drafted for a while now. And uh, maybe we'll find out early next year if they're going to move forward or not. They'd certainly be more specific. OK. I 
again, uh, if anyone else has any questions, you can use that chat box down in the lower right-hand corner. Dan, I'm going to share with you uh, a comment. I had an exchange by email with a person who has uh, ability to fund restoration projects, and uh, they were aware of your report and uh, were critical of it in the sense that they felt that uh, your report is indicative of a kind of uh, effort to take a little more detailed look at these uh, projects than, than this person feels is warranted. So to kind of paraphrase, uh, you're taking too fine of an instrument to, to evaluate these streams, that the important question is, are these projects better after they're done than they were before they were done? And I'm just wondering if you could respond to that. I mean, do you, do you th are you asking too much of these restoration projects? Are you are you getting too academic in your questions about are these uh, restoration projects working or not? Yeah, I. Don't know that it's possible to know too much. As a matter of fact, there's a lot more that I would like to know about these projects. Like I mentioned that at the beginning when we were looking at the that definition of ecological services, um, measuring the amount of phosphorus uptake in a reach or channel, or the denitrification, or how much sediment is being assimilated. Just what do uh, different projects um, do as far as peak flow attenuation? Is, is there any, if we knew those kinds of numbers, if we could quantify that well in that much more detail, maybe we could make some kind of an offset with stormwater detention that takes place with development. Well, there, there's a no end to the detail that can be laboriously <laughs> gone through on all of these sites. As far as burdening anybody with that, I, I think that could be um, misconstrued, and it kind of sounded like that, maybe that's what you were describing. Is 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 there a? I'm I'm not asking people to go out and do all of the things that I did. Uh, I don't think that's the role. I, I, I would be a, I think far too uh, much for a regulatory program to require people to do, or even to review. Uh, I think that what we need to do is find out those key building blocks that um, are simple and measurable and critical. And if those take place, then the important aspects of a healthy stream arise. Uh, and hopefully, those will be measurable. And someone, some academic perhaps, will be out there measuring those things. But the the rest of us, the, the people that are being paid, the consultants that are being paid, and the developers, and maybe they don't know who else can we can go out and stand on it on the on the banks and and wave our hands in the air and say this project looks wonderful or this one gives me a warm and fuzzy feeling, and we can do all that to our heart's content. I don't want to stop anybody from doing that, but I do not think that we can have a regulatory program based on. Uh, hand wavings and warm and fuzzy feelings. I do think that we need to be quantitative about the services that are provided and be efficient. I think we owe that to the people that are paying, footing the bill, as, as well as those of us that are going to reap the benefits. Uh, I think we need to be quanti qu we need to quantify the, um, the, the success and failure of these. Uh, we got several questions that, that came in, Dan. I want to get to those. I also want to acknowledge that it's it's a little after two. If anyone is, uh, you know, needing to get on to other things, that, that's fine. Brian, if you could send out the link to the evaluation for anyone that needs to get off now or soon, uh, so that they can connect to that evaluation, give us their feedback real quick, and that just should have just come up in your text box. And then I want to get to these uh, questions and comments that are coming in. So Dan, uh, Jim Spence asks, would you anticipate that a lot of these sites would develop into a riffle pool morphology over time? And if so, how much so? 
and then uh, as a follow-up, is there still, sorry, it just <laughs> moved on me. Um, is there, are there, is this still the goal of most of these sites? I think he means by that uh, the goal of having a riffle pool morphology. Is that a goal for most of these sites when they're planned? Uh, I, well, yeah, I think that's the, what most of them were designed to be. I, I think that's what uh, many of us had in mind as the desired end state, as a riffle pool. Um, so I, I I would imagine that people are still hoping that that will happen sometime. I, I'm not one of those people. I, I think that we shouldn't hope for something that is not a, that that is a poor fit. Uh, I, I don't think that we should try to force or impose a type of, of stream characteristics on a landscape with the driving variables that are maintaining, developing, and maintaining that stream. I don't think we should impose something that's counter to those driving variables. Um, the only data set that I was, I've was i ever come across that is similar in the amount of energy as the data set that we looked at um, were, was a, one that was described something that they termed swamp, swamp streams. So we've got things like swamp streams, and we've got things like Lowered, even lowered gradient headwaters if we want to account for the influence that beaver may have had on our reference reaches 400 years ago. Um, but uh, no, I, I think that uh, that's misguided uh, and not very efficient, not very effective to desire uh, something that's a that's, uh, poor fit. Kevin Bliss has a question about the recurrence interval and associated with Bankful. He's in central New York, and he says he uh, um, remembers learning several years ago. I won't say how long for your sake. <laughs> uh, sorry, I have to keep paging back up every time something gets posted here. But um, he's questioning a 0.8 year interval for uh, equating to Bankful here in Ohio, his recollection was that they were using something like 2.4 year recurrence or maybe as low as one and a half recurrence interval associated with Bankful in New York. Do you have any response to that or any question or uh, yeah, any yeah, knowledge of that? Sure. Uh, there are two different scales is how we get there. The, the, uh, there's something called a partial duration series um, and an annual peak discharge series. If we look at just the one largest storm that occurs each year, we get the annual peak discharge, or, or we get the annual series. Uh, if we look at uh, all, all of the uh, storm events, we get the partial duration series. There's no way to talk about storms that are more frequent than a one-year recurrence interval if we're only looking at the biggest storm of every year. So when we start looking at smaller storms, it, uh, the words make more, more sense to us if we use the terms of that based on that partial duration series. Um, what it boils down to is, is a 0.8-year recurrence interval storm is often about identical to a 1.3 or 1.5-year recurrence interval storm, just like three-some feet is the same as one meter. It, it depends on the scale that you're using. It's the same uh, distance, or, or it's the same discharge rate. So uh, the number that you heard uh, some years ago uh, was a, or a, more recently the 1.5 anyway, but uh, certainly a big range. But the lower gradient ones will tend on the lower end of that range and even less than 1.5, probably 1.3 year recurrence interval on that annual peak discharge series. Since we get lots of those every year, most every year we get th th that size discharge event, um, it, it makes more intuitive sense not to call it a 1.3 year recurrence interval, but a, a 0.8 year recurrence interval. Okay. And Mike Smith asks, what would a performance criteria for organic material look like? 
uh, percent organic matter would be what it would look like. Uh, one percent organic matter is pretty poor. Uh, Three percent is great. And that would so, be taken in the floodplain. Uh, well, there's a number of number of ways of doing that. Um, sending it off to a lab, uh, soil scientists can estimate it based on color. Uh, so. I mean, where would the sample be taken from? Oh, well, uh, in the riparian area, in that part of the stream that's only uh, inundated during high flows. Uh, yeah, the floodplain. Okay. And then Greg Malia uh, posted kind of a comment in question. Uh, priority, he says, priority two restoration tends to leave some of the bad soil conditions depicted. Are there any recommendations that have been generated from this work or elsewhere in terms of emphasizing or requiring topsoil management or stockpiling related to the construction of these projects in Ohio? Yeah, I think that uh, resoiling, stockpiling topsoil and then resoiling is, uh, is not an uncommon practice. We, uh, that was seen on a number of the projects that, the, that were analyzed. Um, Unfortunately, it wasn't ever, uh, it, it, even the resoiled material did, did not uh, perform very well. Uh, it, whether that was uh, because it, it wasn't all good topsoil might have been part of it. Maybe some of the A horizon along with some of the B horizon. Um, but also just the construction process of moving the, the material around uh, destroys a lot of its structure and compacts it. And the soil scientists, I don't, I don't know looking at the dirt myself whether it's good or bad, but the soil scientists seem fairly disappointed with the quality of material that they were identifying as resoiled. So certainly better than the uh, parent material that would be there, uh, or, that, or the sea horizon maybe that would be there naturally or in place, um, but uh, still lacking. Maybe the the, the worst part about it is that it's put as icing on the cake. It's put, a, it's put on the top layer. So a, a floodplain is constructed and then resoiling materials placed on top of it. Um, out, out in a cornfield, the most important soil is closest to the top. And as you go down deeper, the importance of it diminishes. In a riparian area, we could probably make a case for the most important soil being at that level of the stream bed, that part where it, it's uh, the, the water table is, is at that stage during most days of the year. That's where you have the anoxic conditions, denitrification will occur in those or anoxic conditions. If, it's, if, if you get water movement there and if you have organic matter there. So if you leave that lower whatever portion of your floodplain uh, as the parent material and just put some stuff on top. I don't think we're getting the, the good stuff down there where it's most important, down near the water level, the groundwater level under the floodplain. Natural floodplains will often have even, uh, as the stream is migrated around or the, the floodplains formed, uh, uh, layers of coarse material, fine gravels and sands at, the, at that saturated stream bed elevation through across the floodplain. Water really moves well through that. Uh, it, we, we aren't reproducing that at, by any stretch of the imagination on any of the sites where we saw resoiling material stockpiled and then placed on constructed floodplains. So we got to get a lot better at doing that or not very high have, or have not very high expectations for the results of doing that.